So, um, can everybody see this okay, or should I turn more lights off? Yeah. That's probably better. <laughs> so, um, what I'm going to talk about today is work I've been doing at NIST since 2009 on um, miniaturized high performance atomic clocks. And this is our main building at NIST, and it uh, backs up to open space right in front of the flat iron, so it's a really nice place to work. Um, you can go on hikes at lunch up and around the flat irons, um, which makes it extra nice. And so I'm just going to start with like a review of the definition of the second. And before 1952, the clear definition of the second was that it was one eighty-six thousand four hundredth of a mean solar day, and there's 60 seconds per minute, 60 minutes per hour, 24 hours per day. Um, but it was realized around this time that there were pretty um, wide fluctuations in the actual value of the, of the number of seconds in a day. And it would vary randomly from day to day by several milliseconds. And then there was a, also a drift in the number of seconds per day over longer periods. And so applications then were driving a better um, standard for the second, like radar um, and communications already back then needed timing of better than 10 milliseconds a day. And so they started working on a change in the definition, and that occurred in 1956, where they changed the definition from being based on a day to being based on a year, because it didn't have as wide um, fluctuations on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, but unfortunately, the number of seconds in a year is something that's very difficult to measure. And so it's um, difficult to realize a precise clock based on the orbit of the Earth around the sun. And so it didn't take long after that to realize that you could use atoms to make very stable clocks. And so in 1967, they changed the definition of the second to not be based on astronomy at all anymore. Um, it's based on a energy splitting in cesium atoms that oscillates at 9.192631770 gigahertz. And so to realize a very precise clock then, after this time, you had to illuminate cesium atoms with this radiation and then count that number of oscillations and you'd get a second. And so just a very briefly um, what this means in terms of the atom, all atoms have um, energy levels and they absorb and emit radiation and there's some that absorb from the ground state up to the, these excited states here that are optical, so visual um, radiation, visible radiation, and then there's some that have a much lower frequency, um, and that's this um, hyperfine ground state splitting in cesium at 9.2 gigahertz approximately. And what this corresponds to is the cesium atom has one valence electron and a nucleus, and they both have magnetic moments. And so because of quantum mechanics, they can, they're constrained to either point um, against each other or with, against each other or with each other, and that's the difference between these two energy levels. So when you excite the atom with this radiation, then the, the electron and nuclear spins um, flip orientation. And this is a periodic table of the elements, and so Cesium is over here in the first column. Like I said, it has one valence electron, like a hydrogen atom. Um, there's a lot of other very similar atoms in this column, including rubidium, that's very commonly used for atomic clocks. And they all behave very similarly and have the same type of structure. So we build our clocks based on rubidium. Um, it's a little bit easier, easier for us to work with. And so just to s say a w few words about applications, probably the most important application now for precise timing is the GPS system. 
And so there's a constellation of satellites that orbit the Earth. There's 24 of them that are active at, at all times. There's more that are up there that are backups and that are new ones that are just being launched. And they orbit um, the Earth in several orbital planes, and I think there's four satellites per plane. And then you can realize your position on the Earth by receiving signals from at least four of those. And so if you're standing on a point on the Earth, um, you need four you need to receive four signals to be able to tell where you are. And that's because these um, satellites, the whole system is based on time of flight. And all of these satellites have atomic clocks on board. Okay. Um, and so you have, three, you have three position unknowns, X, Y, and Z, but you also don't know what time it is where you are. And so you need to receive signals from four satellites to figure out your location. Um, but these satellites all have atomic clocks on board, and they all have an uncertainty of about one nanosecond per day. And so that's how far we've come since the definition of the second was changed, where we had 10 milliseconds a day. So one nanosecond is one billionth of a second. And these, these, are, these are, look like black boxes. I'll show you a little bit about what's in them in a moment, but these are rubidium atomic frequency standards. 2R is the, the newest generation. Um, well, no, 2F is the newest generation. This is 2R. And um, what I mainly want to point out here is the size of these things. So um, this one is five liters in volume. And I guess I didn't put on here what power it uses, but they use about 30 watts of power. And so for on a satellite, that's quite a bit of power um, that you need. That's like a light bulb level power. Um, but we're currently working on making these smaller, not just for GPS applications, but many others. But I'll just briefly say something about their performance. So. This is an Allen deviation. This is how in the clock world we always present the clock's uncertainty. And basically what it is, is this is um, 1 times 10 to the minus 11, 1 times 10 to the minus 12. So 1 times 10 to the minus 12 is one part per trillion. And this is averaging time in seconds, and these are both log logarithmic scales. Okay, so these clocks reach an uncertainty of a part per trillion in just a few seconds. And then out to uh, a day, so one day is 86,400 seconds, is when they um, reach a few parts in 10 to the 15 uncertainty. And this corresponds to about 0.3 nanoseconds. And so I work in the Atomic Devices and Instrumentation Group at NIST. And we have the basic philosophy that we can trade some of that performance for improved portability and new applications. Not everything needs 0.3 nanosecond timing uncertainty at a day. Um, and so basically, to illustrate that point, you, you have a desktop. This is the model that I have, a Dell desktop. Is that the state of the art, or is this the state of the art, an iPhone? Um, if I could choose in retrospect, I would rather have invested in this. Um, so that's our philosophy, but it turns out you don't have to trade as much performance as you might expect by making things smaller. And so this slide just shows um, how these clocks are made smaller in one, in one of the realizations of the atomic clocks that we have made. Okay, so this is just a schematic of one of these clocks that's on the GPS satellites. And so there's a vapor cell at the heart of it that uh, contains rubidium-87 atoms and some buffer gas. And the buffer gas just slows the rate of collisions um, between the atoms and the walls. So you get more longer measurement time and better frequency resolution when you measure that hyperfine ground state splitting. And then that... Um, what was your buffer gas? 
it's, typ it's typically a mixture of a few different gases because the gases cause a shift in the frequency. And some of them cause a positive shift in the frequency and some cause a negative shift. And so you pick a balance between um, buffer gases that have opposite shifts and typically it's nitrogen and argon. And so this sits inside a microwave cavity, which is like a metal box that you feed with the frequency of the hyperfine ground state splitting. And then that sets up a standing wave inside the cavity that excites the atoms and causes oscillations between those ground states. And then you also simultaneously illuminate the atoms with light from a lamp and then this light, um, when it goes through the buffer gas, um, gets absorbed less when you hit the resonance, so you, when you hit the proper frequency. Okay, so to make this smaller, um, the first thing you can do is n change from a lamp that you have to excite a discharge in that is a very power-hungry device um, to a laser. It might seem surprising, but you Sorry, you can't see that very well. That says diode laser, but um, these run on about a thousand times less power and are also very small. And when, once you do that, you can actually use the diode laser to interrogate this transition. So instead of um, exciting them with the microwave cavity, you can use the light itself. And so once you take away the, the microwave cavity, then everything else can be made smaller and, and more compact. And this is the first chip scale atomic clock that was made in our group at NIST and was published in 2004. And this is a millimeter. And so the volume of the whole clock is under 10 cubic millimeters. So it's like a, a grain of rice, like a fat grain, grain of rice. Um, the cell, the vapor cell that has the rubidium atoms and the buffer gas in it is shown here and that's under a cubic millimeter in volume. And this particular one used seven, 75 milliwatts which didn't account for the electronics um, but uh, I'll show you some commercial ones that grew out of this that are down to 100 milliwatts for everything including the electronics. And that, these are pictures of commercial ones that were made at a company, Symmetricom, which is the leading atomic clock company in the U.S. And it's very similar um, architecture, but with much better engineering. Um, and these are currently being sold for about $1,500, which is still kind of high. But they're working out manufacturing processes to try to bring that down to a few hundred dollars. It's still being funded by the government. And so, um, just to kind of give you an idea of what th the performance of this instrument is and how it compares to other things, this um, is again a, a log log plot. And on this axis is frequency stability at a day, so that's frequency uncertainty basically. And this is a part per trillion. And this is power, so this is 100 milliwatts, 100 watts. And then on this axis, it just shows the same thing over here, except in terms of timing uncertainty. And so the chip scale clocks, they have a timing uncertainty of about one microsecond per day, which is pretty good. Um, but what's most significant about that is that you achieve that, um, you achieve that level of uncertainty at powers where the uncertainty for other types of commercial clocks is, uh, is much higher. Okay, so you get this 100 milliwatts of power is ba battery operated. These are types of crystal oscillators, of um, commercial crystal oscillators. So you get about, you know, a few orders of magnitude um, better performance for the same amount of power. And so that's the, why these types of clocks are turning out to be pretty revolutionary. Um, but one thing I'd, I'll just mention quickly, and I don't need to explain this in detail, but um, these clocks still need to be calibrated, and that's because they dri the frequency drifts over time, and that's because they have this buffer gas in there, and because the cells are so small, the buffer gas pressure has to be really high, and so these shifts that we were talking about a minute ago are much worse. 
and, and so they, they need periodic calibration. And in the best case, um, you get about a microsecond per day, but unless you calibrate it pretty soon after that, um, your performance will um, drift away. Okay, and so our group developed this chip scale clocks um, in 2004 was published and we have a lot of spin-offs in our group from that have grown out of that. And one thing is so atoms can be used to precisely um, make precise oscillators for atomic clocks but you can also interrogate other transitions in the atoms that are sensitive to perturbations like magnetic fields. And so one of the big um, thrusts in our group is to develop magnetometers and they're turning out to get a lot of interest um, in, from the medical community to measure magnetic fields from the body. Um, the part that I'm focusing on is um, trying to make cold atoms in compact instruments for more precise atomic clocks and also inertial sensing. And so this is what I'm mostly going to talk about today. And so this is another Allen deviation which just shows the timing uncertainty versus time for several different types of clocks. So the chip scale clock specification is shown here in blue and they didn't specify, they're, they're actually achieving better than this now. This is what was specified by DARPA, which was the funding agency that developed the clocks. Um, they get about 10 times better than this, but like I mentioned earlier, like at longer times, the, it stops averaging down. You start get to see drift and um, you can't t have very good timing uncertainty at long times. Okay, and so then I showed you um, also, this is a Allen deviation for one of the clocks that's on the GPS satellites. And then there's these uh, other commercial clocks. This is a cesium beam clock um, that is about, you know, rack mountable size like this. Um, also uses a lot of power, like 30 watts of power. And that performance is shown in green here. And so basically we're funded by DARPA to achieve these specs here that are shown in red. And so we need to build a clock that has performance like this cesium beam clock but for much smaller power and size. And so they would like and who knows how um, far we'll get to be honest but they would like the power um, to get down to about 50 milliwatts and five cubic centimeters of volume. And so this, these are a thousand times lower power and a thousand times smaller than this. And so I mentioned the applications with the GPS. Um, one of them is like to make smaller satellites so you can have redundancy in the system. Um, there are also many other navigation applications, um, like for small uh, aircraft. This is actually a drone. <laughs> There's, they're, believe it or not, they're working on insect drones um, in many places in the United States. Um, and then also another really cool application is, is telecom. And the telecom applications, they surprisingly need very high frequency accuracy so they need it to be um, 10 parts per trillion frequency accuracy um, at the, at the high, top most level of their um, synchronization chain. But it's um, pretty demanding to get that actually in commercial clocks today. So let me go on. And so let me just tell you about the technical approach that we're following now with the clocks we're developing. So we want to improve the long-term stability. So we want to reduce the uncertainty um, for long measurement times over the chip scale atomic clocks um, for the same, sorry, this, act, this is size, weight, and power <laughs> um, by removing systematic frequency shifts. So first of all, we want to remove the buffer gas shift, which is the worst one for CSEX. So instead of using a vapor cell with buffer gas, 
where you use laser cooled atoms. There's also another systematic shift in chip scale clocks that arises from the light and it's the AC Stark shift or the light shift and so we um, instead of modulating so I don't think I mentioned this but the chip scale clocks have a laser that you excite the atoms with and to be able to um, measure that hyperfine ground state splitting you have to modulate the laser frequency and so you put sidebands on the laser frequency that are split by this 6.8 gigahertz. But you can't do that perfectly and you end up with a zero order sideband and higher order sidebands and the power in all of these changes is a function of temperature and age and all of their parameters so the spectrum is drift, constantly drifting so instead of doing that we um, use phase lock lasers so we have relatively perfect uh, spectrum and instead of, so this is power versus frequency, this is intensity versus time, instead of interrogating the atom, the atoms continuously and having the light on all the time, we pulse it. So we use a technique called Ramsey spectroscopy. And so this reduces the light shift by the ratio of the pulse length to the separation. So you can reduce it significantly. And you also don't want to introduce new shifts so in particular, one of the big shifts is from the Doppler effect, and it's the same basic thing you notice all the time if a siren goes by you. You hear a higher frequency when it's approaching you and a lower frequency when it's going away. And the atoms also notice a difference in frequency depending on how they're moving. And so the Doppler shift can be quite large, um, a part in 10 to the 10, and it depends on how long you um, interrogate the atoms for. But you can make it go away if you shine the light on the atom symmetrically from opposite sides. So then you don't have a preferred um, direction of propagation of the light. Okay, so this is a picture of our first generation apparatus. And I don't need to say very much about this, but there's, uh, there's two cells. There's, uh, we use magneto-optical trapping to cool the atoms down to like microkelvin temperatures. And is, is the magneto optical trapping going to be part of your 5 cc then? Um, that's a good question because we don't... Uh, so you um, yeah, it probably... We're, we're working on that level of miniaturization, so right now we're still, they allow us um, 50 cc's. Okay. So, <laughs> but this thing is about 150 cc's. Um, but the beams that we use to generate the magneto-optical trap are small, they're only like three millimeters, but um, this is our first generation apparatus. And one of the nice things actually about making things small you don't lose everything. Now the performance in some ways can be better. Um, and so when we have everything small, we can only interrogate the atoms for very short periods because the atoms fall under gravity and they move by about a half a millimeter in 10 milliseconds. Okay, so if we want to use millimeter scale beams, we can only interrogate the atoms for about 10 milliseconds. And so we have a magneto-optical trap that we turn off when we interrogate the atoms and when we're done we turn it back on and we recapture most of the atoms which you never hear about that in large magneto-optical traps um, this is kind of a new phenomenon from the last few years that's gotten into the literature but these are measurements of the um, number of atoms in the trap versus the cooling time so this is um, 0.2 seconds um, and this is all normalized to the steady state number of atoms if you just left the light and the mod on. And so these are different Ramsey times, so this is different off times for the mod. Typically we use 8 milliseconds, which is this pink trace. So after an interrogation we turn the light back on and we, are, we still have 80 percent of the atoms that were there before. And so that's a nice thing about making things small. And I don't need to go into this very much and you 
can't even see it very well, but um, we use a technique called coherent population trapping um, to interrogate the atoms. And these sh th this picture down here shows the energy levels of the atoms. These are the hyperfine ground states. And it shows them in a magnetic field. Um, actually, they, there's several sublevels, magnetic sublevels in each of these. Um, and we actually interrogate them with what are called these lambda transitions. And we use linearly polarized light, which is a superposition of left and right circularly polarized light. Um, but maybe I'm going into too much detail here, but just to mention that we use this scheme, it's uh, all optical. Um, but we actually in end up interrogating two transitions. They're both shown in red here. And uh, you get shifts from the magnetic field in those frequencies, but they cancel if they're, those two transitions are balanced. And so this shows the clock configuration. So we have two lasers um, that we use to interrogate the atoms, to interrogate the clock transition. We have a third laser that we use for laser cooling. And these are all pretty compact and um, simple laser systems. And we overlap the light from the master and the slave onto a photodiode that can operate at high frequencies. And we detect that electrical signal there and then um, use feedback to lock the separation between the two frequencies of these lasers. And then we put the light through a beam splitter onto the atoms and then the light reflects from a mirror and comes back down and then we detect the absorption that we get and when you're on resonance the atoms stop absorbing light. And so this is a spectrum that we get. This is the Ramsey spectrum. Um, so let me just get all that stuff up. So typically we cool the atoms for 45 milliseconds. We put them into this dark state where they stop absorbing light and that takes about 300 microseconds. Um, we leave the light off for eight milliseconds and then we use a probe pulse to measure the absorption after this um, time. And because of the way we do this, um, because of this Ramsey spectroscopy, you don't just get a simple resonance, you get fringes, interference fringes. And so what you measure is the position of the central fringe. And so this is a measurement done with about two million atoms and the signal to noise in one hertz, um, so in one that you get if you measure it for one second is about 117. And so these are um, results from our first generation system. And so this is the spec that we're supposed to meet this May. Um, and so over, out to about an hour, we're meeting the spec um, the, from DARPA. So this is a part per trillion down here at the bottom. And then uh, there's, so there's two types of dots on here. There's the red, which are our clock measurements, and then there's gray. And those are frequency drifts that we expect from our magnetic field drift that we measure with the atoms. And so currently our long-term frequency stability is limited by magnetic fields in our lab. But our first generation system was not shielded from magnetic fields. But we have a new shielded system now that's just starting to get up and running. And so the volume, and this doesn't count all the optics, um, but this is 80 cubic centimeters and that includes the vacuum pump. What kind of pump is that? It's a 0 0.4 liter per second ion pump. Oh, okay. And uh, so this is a, the end cap, one of the end caps for the magnetic shield. And one of the things that we did um, that's kind of unique in this system is we totally fixed the axes of all of the laser beams. So we machined this block and these uh, sle metal sleeves that completely constrained the axes because in our first generation system it was murder to try to align all the beams. And so we removed that problem and we can trap a lot of atoms. We're still characterizing it. Um, and all of the light is fiber coupled to the system. So that's the picture of it without the shields. That's it with the shields. And so this is 10 centimeters in height. And 
unfortunately I didn't put any data from that system in this talk yet. We're just now starting to get some. Um, but so like I mentioned before, the Zaman shift um, is the largest source of drift in our current system. And so the way that we figured that out was that we, here you have the energy levels again. So the clock transitions are shown in red. And then there's this other transition that we can excite that's a field sensitive transition. Um, and it's shown in blue. And so when we run the clock, then every nine minutes, we jumped the frequency splitting um, for the lasers to <coughs> measure this blue transition. And then we can measure um, with the atoms what the magnetic field is. And that's how we got these gray points. And the drift that that corresponds to is 6.5 microhertz a second. And to reach our goal at a, at a day, we, that we need to reduce that by quite a large factor down to 33 nanohertz per second. And so that's a factor of 200. And so like I said, we, now we have shields and the shielding factor is, a, is 100. And when we have the shields, this is one detail I didn't go into, and, uh, but you always have to have some field, some magnetic field on the atoms because that sets a preferred axis or a reference system in the atoms between the atoms and the lasers. And um, with the current system or the first generation system, since it's not in a magnetic shield, we had to make that value really high, but we'll be able to reduce that by a factor of four. And so we, we should be able to make this problem go away. But um, hopefully we'll be able to demonstrate that soon. And so another big shift in our clock is from the Doppler shift, that's what I um, alluded to already. And so we have atoms that we trap in a magneto-optical trap, then we turn everything off, and they accelerate under gravity. And so they move through the phase fronts of the interrogation light. Just like if you're standing still and a siren's moving toward you or away from you, you get a shift. And um, this is it's proportional to the actually turns out to be proportional to the distance the atoms move divided by the Ramsey time. And so this can be a part in 10 to the 10 for 10 millisecond interrogation. And you might even get more shifts from uh, accelerations that you give to the atoms when you release them from the trap. Um, and to reduce that shift or even remove it, you can just interrogate the atoms with a standing wave. And so we evaluated this shift in detail. Um, and we did an experiment where we captured the atoms in a MOT, magneto-optical trap, and then we let them fall before we start interrogating them. And so this changes um, the Doppler shift that you get because they are moving faster by the time you interrogate them. And so you can measure the shifts that you get from doing this and then compare it to a model to see how well you understand the shift. And so we basically what we do is we set up an experiment with independent up and down beams that hit the atoms. They're on all the time. Both of them are on for both pulses. But we look at the signals from only the down beam, only the up beam, or the average of the up and down beam. And I don't need to talk about this much, but the phase varies over space. Um, and you can figure out from very basic um, kinematics from Newtonian physics how far the atoms move as a function of time and work out a very simple model for what the shift should be. And it changes sign depending on whether you look at them from below or above. So we changed the apparatus um, a little bit. It's a little more complicated so that we could independently measure the up and down signals. Um, and these are measurements that we made uh, a few months ago. And so the red and the blue lines are the models. This is uh, Ramsey time of one milliseconds, two and six. And this is free fall time. And these are frequency shifts from zero to 40 hertz. And so you have points um, that are measurements for the down signal, the up signal, and the average. And what you notice, what you might notice is that uh, 
the actual shifts are a little bit smaller than what we predict from the model, but we have an explanation for that um, that I still have to confirm, but um, I won't go into the details on that, but it's a nonlinear effect in the atoms. And one of the interesting things, we also measured this, so depending on where the atoms start, um, you get a shift as well, and this is also related to the Doppler shift. Because when we excite the atoms with a standing wave, that, bear with me here. <laughs> we excite the atoms with a standing wave, and if the intensities are perfectly balanced between the up and down beams, then you get the average, the atoms see the average phase between the up and down beams at all positions. So the phase is constant as a function of position, but the amplitude is modulated. And so when you, um, so, so it doesn't matter where you excite the atoms, they always have the same phase to begin with. And so then you get an offset as a function of position because when you probe the atoms with the second pulse here, you get a different phase. And so this is, these are shifts that uh, we measured up to 200 hertz, which is huge. Um, this is the stability, and this is for a very short Ramsey time, so it's not very impressive. This is a part per billion um, at the bottom. But when you're at a peak of the standing wave, so when you're at an anti-node where the field is strongest, you get the best stability and you get the smallest shifts. And it's easy to align the system to this point because you just look at the size of the signals that you get. And just, I guess I still have a little bit of time. I'll quickly go through this. So you also get light shifts. Um, and there's several contributions and it's kind of complicated. Um, but so these are all the three different contributions. So this is frequency shift versus intensity in all cases. And there's a resonant coherent shift. And interestingly, this one gets bigger as you go to smaller intensity. And so this is shown for different detunings from resonance. And if you're exactly on resonance, there's no shift. But you always have some detuning, so you worry about all of these. And then there's a resonant incoherent shift, which comes from the incoherent part of our uh, excitation spectrum because we use these phase locks to generate our uh, interrogation light, but they're not perfect. So we get about 80% of the light in the coherent um, beat note, but the rest is kind of background that uh, causes light shifts and no signal. And so this part is proportional to intensity. And then there's a non-resonant shift from a detuned excited state level that uh, is linear in intensity and it doesn't depend very much on detuning at these levels. But when you add these three together, you get something that looks like this. And these are measurements that we made in the lab. Um, this is a shift in hertz versus intensity for several different detunings. So it looks quite similar to what I showed is the sum of those three contributions. This is a simulation that I did um, to try to figure out what the different contributions were. Um, but it turns out the important thing is that we get about a hertz, one hertz of frequency shift per megahertz of optical detuning in our system. And this pink line for zero detuning nicely lines up with what we expect the magnetic field shift to be. So that's nice. These are absolute frequency measurements. Um, but if you look at what level we are able to stabilize our op the optical frequencies of our lasers, we stabilize them to the kilohertz level. So the shift from this is still negligible for us. It's a few parts in 10 to the 13. So um, that's fine. So that was nice to see because this is a something that we worried about. And so um, just getting close to the end here, but I just want to summarize what the shifts are that in our system. And so this is actually me like 10 years ago, um, standing next to um, the atomic fountain clock at NIST. And this, in this clock, they worry about a different group of um, shifts. 
So black body shift, cold collisions, gravitational red shift, also the Zeeman shift um, they worry about from magnetic fields. And you don't care very much about the size of the shift. You care, you, although you do care about that, you care about the uncertainty in your estimate of it because you can correct for it. And so these are the main shifts that affect this clock, but for us, they don't matter at all because ours is based on a totally different way of looking at the atoms. Um, so our main shifts are the Zeeman shift, the first order Doppler shift, and the CPT light shift. And this is a, another picture of our second generation clock. And this is a student's hand who's aligning the, um, the fibers. And so already, in this system, well, we have not pro proven it yet. We know that the Zeeman shift is probably going to be about 400 times smaller. So it'll basically go away um, because its uncertainty will, will become much, much smaller. And um, then we'll be left with this first order Doppler shift and the CPT light shift that we can also keep trying to beat down the errors of. But um, we expect that we'll at least reach a, a part per trillion accuracy. Um, but it remains to be seen. Maybe we'll get 10 times better than that. But already at this level, um, there's a lot of applications for a system like this. And one of the things about it that I, I want to mention at the end is that um, it's possible it won't require any calibration at all. So the clocks that are on the GPS satellites now, they, they have a buffer gas in them, and so they have frequency drift, and they're calibrated once a day. So they're, they're constantly measuring each other's signals, and they're being compared on the Earth, and corrections are sent once a day. So it could be possible that these won't need any corrections at all. And so um, future work, so we'll keep reducing these systematic frequency shifts and figure out how accurate it can get. Um, testing it against a perfect reference at NIST, we have um, clocks like this. This occupies two rooms that are, well, maybe a, a room this size. Um, this is just part of it. Um, there's a lot of lasers and electronics as well. Um, and we'll also keep making the system smaller and take advantage of microfabrication methods and test scaling. So these are other measurements that we did in my lab um, recently for the number of atoms that you can get in a magneto-optical trap versus the trap size. We did this in another experiment. And so um, these are measurements from other groups that are shown as open sim symbols. There was some uncertainty as to where this transition should occur, so you'd predict with, uh, through the theory that you would get a, about d to the fourth dependence for large beam sizes, and at some point it should change to a d to the sixth um, dependence, and then the atom number just drops like a rock. And so it's important to know where that occurs. And so we um, made these measurements in our lab, and you, you still get about a million atoms, which is enough um, for beam sizes that are all, uh, just a few millimeters. And then another thing that we're doing is we're adapting the system to other types of cold atom instruments. I'm sorry, you can't see that very well, but this is another experiment in my lab um, where we're building up an atom interferometer um, to measure, to do inertial sensing. Okay, so I'll end by just acknowledging the people that I work with. Um, this is John Kitching, our group leader. And then there's a visiting scientist from Russia, Eugene Ivanov, and Francois Xavier Eno. He's from France. Um, he did a lot of the clock work that I told you about today. Unfortunately, he went back in uh, October, and so I've been in the lab a lot more <laughs> since he left. And then there's another visiting postdoc um, from Austria, and this, uh, this is Eric Blanchin and Greg Hoth. They're both graduate students in my lab. So thanks very much. Questions? Are you, are you using uh, <coughs> for your help? Are you using help Helm coils for, the, or are you? Help, yeah. So we use Helmholtz. Yeah. Helmholtz. It's home if, yeah. the, if the currents are going. <laughs> 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 yeah. So for the magneto optical trap, yeah, yeah. we do use those yeah. because so to generate a constant magnetic field, the currents go in the same way. So you need those for, 
Yeah, you need. They need. And I don't know if I can do that with my. F <laughs> they go in opposite directions to generate like a quadrupole field for the magneto optical trap. So anti Helmholtz or <laughs> Helmholtz. <Hiltzholm. laughs> Oh, and I was supposed to repeat the question for the camera, but I mm -hmm. <laughs> the answer. What, Mom? Scientific question. What is DARPA? So DARPA is our funding agency. And like a, lo a lot of physics research is funded through the Department of Defense. And this is Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency. And it's a huge kind of secretive funding agency. Um, they have a lot of even classified stuff that um, I don't even want to know about. I could know about because I'm a government employee and I went to one of their meetings and immediately felt, uh, was made to feel not welcome because they didn't want me to know <laughs> what they were doing. <laughs> but the, um, so they fund things like, they funded the development of the internet. Um, they funded, but they fund a lot of uh, more direct military things like the F-16 and um, rifles and stuff. They fund uh, medical research, all kinds of different things. But there's a lot of military applications for precise timing, like the GPS system. Um, it's used for everything now, but the applications for the military are what's driving it because they always want to make th these drones, they want to make missiles that are more accurate, so they all work on GPS. How, how are they okay with Russians, Austrians, and French working? Well, um, they, um, so I, I did work on a different DARPA pro project on gyroscopes that was more secretive a few years ago and I wouldn't have, that would not have been allowed, but this, um, so there's different types of restrictions. There's um, ITAR restrictions, so inter international trafficking and arms restrictions, which uh, the other program was under and that would not allow me to, to speak openly about it because I am trafficking arms by telling you about it. And um, so I'm, by telling foreign nationals about it, I'm uh, violating the um, agreements. But this it doesn't fall under that. Um, none of the clock programs ever have ever fallen under that. And one of the interesting things to me when I, I go to these DARPA meetings, and there's one next week in Boulder, um, is that almost all of the higher ups are immigrants from other countries. My um, program manager is uh, from Russia, immigrant from Russia. They're all naturalized citizens now. The um, Most of the experts in the clock community are immigrants from other countries. So, are there going to be uh, eventually applications where they can send out these clocks to schools, like colleges, like us? Um, well, you could get one now for fifteen hundred dollars if you yeah. want one of the <laughs> chip scale clocks, or you might be able to get it for less because it's an educational institution. I can ask. Oh, okay. They ultimately, or maybe. Um, yeah, uh, so y I remember that you asking me this question before if we have old experiments that we can send <laughs> down. Maybe we should live Labor Day sale. Labor Day More questions? Okay, so the question is, how does inertial navigation work? So, um, and it also comes about from military applications. So, it's also called dead reckoning. They tend to pick these scary things, ways to describe it. <laughs> but if you know, if you know um, what your position is exactly, and you have a good timing timing reference, or and, y and you can measure all of your accelerations and um, rotations, then you can know where you are at all time. 
and so if you don't need to use the GPS and so that's another application that's driving um, all of this interest in DARPA is for dead reckoning because if there if there is a big war and hopefully there will never be one again because now it's even more dangerous than ever um, the first thing to go will be the GPS system because all of the, I mean the, the countries that we would have a world war with are capable of shooting it down so that's pretty much understood so they want to have a redundancy and so the another thing is there's all these other applications that use precise timing um, like all the cell phone towers they have GPS receivers because they can get their um, accurate time from the GPS signals and so if the GPS system goes down and it doesn't have to be because of a war it can be because of a glitch or because of a hacker or then no one can use their cell phones and so they want to have a backup so that they can um, keep working if, if the GPS system goes away. But the GPS system is so nice because it's free, it's all coming at us at all times and you can just pick up these signals and figure out what time it is. Mm -hmm. You talked about a, a compass in there now, was that intended to be a magnetic compass? Because you're, you're, you're very sensitive to the magnetic fields and <coughs> I mean it was on one of your slides. Oh yeah, hmm, I That's can't remember. Showed something about a compass. Now, was that intended to be no. a magnetic compass? Or? No. Uh, or is that? I don't remember where that is, but. Um, <laughs> That's way back. So um, there, there is a big application for magnetic compasses too, for because of navigation, because you can use the Earth's magnetic field. The Earth's magnetic field is. I mean, it varies, but it's pretty well know, known what direction it points depending on where you are. And so um, there, there are applications for um, using the magnetic field for navigation. And I don't remember where that is, but um, we don't work on any of those. But we, I've gotten inqu inquiries about that. <coughs> I think I was here.